Okay. Um, good afternoon, all. On yeah, behalf afternoon. of it's still, it's still o'clock now. On behalf of the private pediatricians uh, group, I'd like to formally welcome all of us to the last presentation for the year 2021. It's been uh, an interesting year since we started, and uh, wish all of us compliments of the season. I'm sure we all had a good time at Christmas, and we hope that the next year will be a better year for each and every one of us. So today, we're talking about childhood epileptic encephalopathy, and we have Dr. Salisu presenting, while Professor Falabi Leshi would moderate the session. So without much ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Mola Jilawal for his remarks, and then we'll go straight to the presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Hand over to you, sir. OK, uh, thank you very much for the brief introduction, uh, Dr. Leto. I joined him in um, uh, wishing everyone compliments of the season and congratulating you for navigating this year successfully. Uh, I wish everyone a very happy new year uh, in advance. And uh, I thank God for, the, for his protection and for his mercies uh, in enabling us to survive and be here. And not only that, you know, for what we have been able to do together on this platform. Uh, this is the seventh consecutive meeting that we have had, monthly meeting that we have had. Uh, we have not missed one since we started in June 29. And uh, that is remarkable. And it can only be because of you know, the discipline and the sheer diligence of pediatricians. And even today being holiday period, I mean, it, it must be only pediatricians that can meet at this time of the year. So I, I want to thank everyone who is present here. I'm sure more people will join us. And to um, say that I look forward to a very interesting session. I want to thank Professor Leshi, uh, apart from being a professor of pediatric neurology, he's also the dean of the clinical sciences at the College of Medicine for making time to be here with us despite his busy schedule. It's great to see Dr. Salisu, um, you know, uh, and uh, our members join from diaspora as well. I see Dr. Okobo, Mike Okobo, uh, Haro Shodipo, uh, Dr. Nifade, and, and so on. I can't see all the others now. But I welcome everyone. Um, going forward, we, we have been, the coordinators and I have been deliberating on how we are going to move this group forward. Um, we have more or less agreed that we need to transform into a society or an association uh, with a proper executive committee and, uh, you know, so that we can, we, we can have some formality in what we are doing. Also, to be able to, right now we've been concentrating mainly on the clinical pediatrics. Uh, but you agree with me that we earn our bread, uh, not only by clinical pediatrics, but also by managing it properly and professional uh, side as well. So we hope that in the, year, in the year coming, we will be able to consolidate on what we are doing in the clinical side uh, but also introduce some more uh, of you know, education, continuing education in professional sites as well as management sites. So for this, we need a structure. Um, so I think the way we we'll go is to um, ask that, I hope everyone is in agreement with this. Who, if there's anyone who is not in agreement, you can please indicate to us on the platform after this. Uh, and if we don't have any objection to that, uh, in the early in the new year, I should be posting on the platform uh, the way and manner in which we are thinking we should proceed. Um, so on that note, I'm happy to see everybody, very, very happy at this time of the year, to see everybody. Um, again, uh, I wish you a very happy holiday season. Um, i hand over back to you, Dr. Elitu, for continuation of the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So, um, 
I would like to hand over to Dr. Professor Neshi now as the moderator, and then they will hand over to Dr. Salisu. Thank you, Dr. Professor Neshi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I really am happy to be part of this um, session, uh, which um, continues a series of education for pediatricians in private practice. I think it's a good thing. I also particularly welcome our colleagues from West Africa, all over West Africa, from Sierra Leone, from Liberia. <clears throat> also our colleagues in the diaspora, really great that you could <clears throat> because there is no limit. To, so while we'll be talking about Nigerian children, what we could easily be talking about children anywhere in the world. And so I, I welcome all of you. Uh, the session is pretty straightforward. They will have a presentation from Dr. Mohamed Salisu, who's one of the very few pediatric neurologists we have in practice in, in, in Lagos. Uh, and even in the, in, in the we're very few in, in the country. And it's indeed an honor to hear him speak on an important topic as this, which baffles quite a number of even pediatric neurologists. And so I, I think we are going to have a very wonderful afternoon. And then we will take um, questions afterwards. So please, during the course of the lecture, feel free to put the questions in the chat box. And what I will do, I will then call on people to either ask their question or read out the questions just in case we have network issues. And then Dr. Salisu will then respond to them. Um, on that note, um, I, I really hope we have a wonderful time. And I then invite Dr. Mohamed Salisu, um, pediatric neurologist, to make his presentation on childhood epileptic encephalopathies. Over to you, Dr. Salisu. Uh, thanks, uh, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to hope that uh, I am heard. I'd like to get some feedback. Am yes, I we can hear you. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Yes. Um, Okay, so in 40 minutes, I'm going to try to uh, make some talk about um, a topic that I've been in romance with for about five years now. Um, yes, I've been in neurology, child neurology for over 15 years, but I just noticed in the last five years from about 2016, I started seeing this pattern of presentation in children with uh, epilepsies. And then fortunately, um, being that I had EEG machines with me, and uh, so I just started to see the direction in which things were going, and I started putting them together. There's just an apology I need to make, which is that um, I'm sorry, the EEG uh, uh, films you're going to see are not mine because the EEG machine that had my own original uh, EEG uh, images actually is uh, temporarily down. So I had to go to the net and borrow some of the uh, EEGs. But I can assure you that just exactly the same. I would have loved so much that you would have seen classic Nigerian EEG images. So with that said, um, you will see this outline that I have stated here in terms of how we go about it. I'll try to define what the childhood epileptic encephalopathies are and what I'm intending to achieve with this uh, presentation, what the pathophysiology of these conditions are and classify them. And then just discuss briefly the profile and management of um, at least three of these, that infantile spasms, Lennox Gastro and Lando Klefner. And then Mike mentioned along the line about the uh, Otahara syndrome, EME, Dravet, and Rasmus syndrome. Um, then we look at um, the management along the line and then emphasize the role of the electroencephalogram in the management and then our final take home messages. So, what are uh, uh, childhood epileptic encephalopathies? There are four operative words they are an epileptic condition, etiology is heterogeneous, and the Manifestation is, is with epileptic form ab abnormalities that are associated with progressive dysfunction of cerebral function, which is called an encephalopathy. We should note that the ongoing epileptic activity itself works, worsens the clinical condition in the child. And the encephalopathy often manifests with behavioral, cognitive, and motor regression 
as the hallmarks. Um, these conditions occur at a critical period of brain development, and theoretically, it is assumed that when we abort the epilepsy activity, then we are able to improve clinical outcome. Operating word being that this intervention has to be done early of ongoing seizure activity. So what do we want to achieve? We have achieved defining, and therefore we'll be talking about classifying the cephalopathies um, after discussing the pathophysiology. The pathophysiology is not really fully understood that it differs with the type, but it all of them affect the brain that is developing, and we have ongoing seizure activity, either electrographic or um, active uh, ictal seizures. The seizure activity is very aggressive and it leads to excessive excitability in the brain. Now, the manifestations of this activity varies with the age and stage of brain maturity. In the neonate, what you will see is post suppression. In the infant, you tend to see ipsorrhythmia, and in the child, you see generalized sharp wave seizures. Of course, change occurs with the advancing age. You can find a child progress from post suppression to ipsorrhythmia to generalized sharp wave discharges. This is a function of age. Um, characteristically, we find out that electrographic EEG activity is often aggressive. Seizures are usually multiform and intractable. Cognitive behavioral and neurological deficits occurring, they may be very relentless and early death sometimes occur. In classifying um, epileptic encephalopathies in childhood, classified by age, it's the neonatal, the infantile, the childhood, and adolescent slash adult. You will see that there are about four of them that have uh, marked out here. These four actually have um, definitely witnessed in my practice, and then um, all the four cases have actually been published at, in uh, different um, journals. Um, with the neonatal uh, uh, epilepsy, epileptopathies, encephalopathies, you will find towards the end, I need to mention certain things which for those of us in private practice, we need to particularly pay attention to, otherwise we're going to miss them. The, that's the early infantile epileptic encephalopathy, otherwise known as Otahara. The man Otahara actually is the one that started the term uh, epileptic encephalopathy. Then there's the early myoclonic epilepsy. The infantile, we have the severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy, that's the Dravet syndrome, the infantile spasm slash West syndrome. The difference actually lies in the presence of hypsorrhythmia. Then there's malignant epilepsy with migrating partial seizures in infancy. With childhood, we have particularly Lennox Gasto acquired a, a, a physic epileptic encephalopathy. That's the Landau Kleffner, and then epilepsy with continuous spike and waves during slow wave sleep. And then in the adolescent group, we have the Rasmussen syndrome. Um, this next slide tends to give us an idea of how these encephalopathies uh, evolve from the neonatal period in the uh, uh, up onto uh, um, the adult adolescent uh, period. So you can see um, the evolution from the left um, towards the right. So what, what I'll be doing now is just to run us through uh, a few selected cases. That would be exactly infantile spasms, Lenos Gastro, Arlan, and Klefner. I might talk about Rasmussen along the line. Um, Infantile spasms. When we want to diagnose, we need to keep in mind that there are three things we're looking for. The spasm activity, the infant, arrest of psychomotor development, and what is termed to be hypsorrhythmia. Age of onset is usually between three and 12 months, but I've seen as early as one month and as late as 24. It occurs more in males than females. The spasms we see are uh, usually sudden, a brief, usually bilateral, tonic uh, contraction of the axial and mean muscle. Asymmetric unilateral presentation can also occur. Spasms often occur in clusters. You can have as much as one to 30 per day, and each of these attacks may have as much as 20, 150 attacks. But because they are so brief, less than a very few seconds, if we don't pay attention, 
we may not see them and we need to take time to specifically ask and break these things down. The types of spasms can be flexor extensor, flexor surround spasms or extensor moral like moral reflex like. One thing that is also very important in um, taking the history is to recognize that there's an association of these spasms with uh, what we call the twilight state, when the child is about going into sleep or coming out of sleep. If you specifically ask, it's like an aha moment for the mother. The mother says, yes, yes, I noticed that when this child is going to sleep or when this child is waking up, this uh, spasm seem to occur more. Then also some of them, uh, when there are loud noises or tactile stimulation or feeding, they also could precipitate the spasms. More, majority of causes are symptomatic in about 80%, and idiopathic causes are like 20%. And the symptomatic causes, uh, we have hypoxic injury, cerebral malformations, infection, hemorrhage. Um, these are about the commonest that I have seen in, in, my, in my practice. Um, unfortunately, with the metabolic disorders, I can only say I have suspected a few, but I have not really been able to go further to uh, investigate. Genetic conditions, well, it's obvious when you see somebody with a Down syndrome or tuberous sclerosis, but um, some of these other genetic conditions, it's just because the child is dysmorphic, and then you start to think, okay, there's some genetic pain possibly here, but I have not started to evaluate on the genetic line as yet. Now, in terms of uh, treating children with infantile spasms, I would say that uh, the jury is out. There is an image forwards and backwards, depending on what uh, you are reading, which year you are reading, whether you belong to the Europeans or the Japanese, or you belong to the Americans, you're going to find people say all sorts of things. But everybody tends to agree that, okay, ACTH is the best of the lot. And when we're saying the best, we're not talking about 90% effectiveness or something of that region. We just say, well, it tends to give the best outcome. Of course, its own problem lies with uh, the fact that it's intramuscular, the fact that it's expensive, the fact that they've been using it for a long time, in fact, that it has its associated side effects, but well, ACCH is still the best of the pack. Then um, there's Viga battery, which uh, is best when you're dealing with tuberous sclerosis. But now, with the uh, British people, they're beginning to say that uh, any form of structural cause of the infantile spasms, the Viga battery should be able to uh, work in this category of people. However, you must understand that uh, one major side effect with bigger battery has to do with the um, effect of peri peripheral um, vision. So that problem is there. Then, of course, we have the steroids. Uh, Prednisolone is the easiest of the group, but um, there are also people who have tried methyl prednisolone and there are those who have also tried the dexamethasone. So I think I should at this point say that uh, prednisolone has been uh, the go to my practice for obvious reasons. And uh, there's had its own fair uh, outcome, and uh, it's also had its own fair amount of ABR. The commonest uh, adverse effect that I've had with prednisolone has had to do with irritability, weight gain. Um, sometimes you have gastric irritation, um, and then some of the children tend to have um, hypertension. Other than that, uh, fairly done quite well. Then with the anti-epileptic drugs, then you start to play around whether we're dealing with valparate, levetiracetam, the pyramid, amotrogine, benzo, so the and all of that. Um, each one of them, there are people who swear by them. But I would easily tell you that uh, in this business, you are going to have to develop your own uh, your own decisions, more or less. So you would start what has been advised. For example, I would say that Valparaiso is a very common medication that I would start as an AG. But down the line, things happen and you find yourself having to uh, consider using some other medication as adults or um, as replacement. Ketogenic diet, I've not done ketogenic diet, but it's also been proven to be of use. Then surgery, hemispherectomy, medically intractable cases, in places where surgery uh, is uh, possible, yes, in some cases you would need to uh, consider surgery. 
But you know that uh, the effect of the AEDs on long-term developmental outcome and research findings, as I have told you, these are things we need to keep in mind. So what uh, do we expect from all of these in terms of prognosis? Fair, if treatment is started early, uh, the low mortality of 5%, of course, is assuming that the child was picked up early, um, diagnosis was made early, uh, appropriate medications were given, and the child was properly followed. But I can tell you that uh, if I use by my own outcome, uh, mortality could be as high as uh, 10%. 60% uh, of cases would develop other seizure types. Um, in fact, actually, about uh, a third of cases of children that have lemon gas to, in my experience, have actually been children who had infantile spasms. 50% of them go to develop permanent mental disabilities, so you need to keep that in mind. Um, Two thirds will develop severe cognitive and psychological impairment, and then about 5 to 12 percent have normal mental health. I need to make a statement here in terms of. Uh, the cause of the disease, the management. I think we need to break it down into three groups, uh, three, three stages. Stage one being you want to abort the seizure. And you want to abort the seizure as quickly as possible. And you want this to happen within the first 14 days. The earlier you can abort the seizure within this 14 day period, the better for you. If you look at how the British are doing it, the British want to target aborting seizures for 14 days or within the 14 day period. Second thing would be stabilizing the child and noting that the hips arrhythmia has actually um, disappeared. Then you now start to look at whether um, the child is uh, having any uh, cognitive or behavioral or neurological deficit that is associated. And then three months later, you must anticipate that even when the seizures have stopped, in those who the seizures have stopped, you must anticipate that there's a likelihood that the, uh, the, boss, op uh, the boss operation or whatever it is can actually re re return within three months or even a new seizure type can actually return. Now, if you have the classic seizure type return, the good news about that is that the effect of this on the brain is not as bad as the first time. The problem only lies with if you were not able to attain seizure control the first time. But if you were able to attain seizure control the first time, even when the uh, seizures return the second time, the drop seizures that you have is not actually as bad. And then, of course, like I said, in the long term, which is the third stage, it will now be the issue of uh, cognitive, behavioral, and neurological deficit. And these are things you need to first keep in mind and you also need to discuss with the family of the child. Um, this next slide actually uh, just shows you uh, a, a, a summary of the profile of uh, 40 children that's been seen in the last uh, 30, uh, 30, uh, the last three years in my practice at Lasso. And uh, you will see that, uh, I just wanted to give you a brief of some of this, just to see that there have been 40 cases that are more males than females at about 1.5 to one, and the ages are range from three to 24 months, and then we meet at about five months, and then mostly decision type are in head drops, occasionally in the generalized to the seizures or jackings, and then the mode of delivery has been mostly vaginal, um, 17 cases had prolonged in four, and then about seven cases ended up with emergency one um, segment cesarean section. And then etiology is that the parental asphyxia hypoxic injury in 14 cases, meningitis in two, majority three, structural injury in one, and the unknown cases in 11. But if you go back and look at uh, the last line, nine children actually had imaging done. So when we say structural brain injury, one, is not exactly totally true because there were just nine uh, cases of imaging done, and four out of these nine actually showed abnormal imaging. Cortical atrophy with ventricular megaly was absent in septum pedicin. Um, the greatest feature is post suppression on the EEG, and then hips arrhythmia only occurs in four cases. 
Now, this uh, slide actually was trying to start uh, one of the papers that showed uh, a case of a uh, uh, series of children that actually graduated from different class parts and levels down to the series of uh, the one I just presented on different class parts and is still being prepared and has not been published. But this particular one has been published, but I've not, I, I will just really get around to it. Yeah. Now, the EEG picture we will see. You find in interactal state uh, during sleep and in each state. Hips arrhythmia, which is uh, characterized by this nice pattern, it's asynchronous, very high amplitude story, frequent multifocal spikes, and sharp weight discharges. This um, is the ideal that you see spoken about, but in my experience, uh, hips arrhythmia doesn't, uh, is not that common. The commonest thing I've seen actually has been uh, just uh, slow, generalized slow wave activity with also suppression uh, pattern. But occasionally, I find multiple spikes and additional sharp wave discharges. But if arrhythmia is not very common uh, in, in my experience of the 40 cases. But then maybe if you look at the next line, it says this pattern gradually gets more organized, fragmented, and disappears by the age of two to be replaced by the slow generalized sharp weight pattern that I discussed about. So you also may argue and say that is it that maybe the time I'm seeing them um, became later, two months, three months, four months from the time the problem started, which is why I'm not saying that. Again, I would say that because the series I, I've just showed you is a retrospective one. So the hope is that from January, there's going to be a prospective uh, review, and then I might just be able to answer that question definitively. Now, when you do the EEG in sleep, in the awake uh, state, you get more synchronous activity. In the non rapid eye movement, the hips arrhythmia tends to show better, and the rapid eye movement, relatively normal pattern. What I want to bring out here is experiential because I do the EEGs myself, and uh, so I've tended to see that actually the stage in which you do the EEG affects what you find. So we need to really be very, very careful when we send for EEG. That this might be even as persons, you need to specifically state that, look, I want this child to be uh, you know, awake or in early stage sleep, not that the child will have been snoring for like 30 minutes before we start the EEG. Find anything in the ical stage? Maybe the EEG was done while the child was convulsing. Then one tends to see the high voltage episodic, low amplitude generalized slow waves and diffuse attenuation, which we call the electrodetrimental slowing. So you get that burst, which is the high uh, amplitude, uh, disobedient, non following any rule kind of sharp waves or spike waves or multifocal waves. And then you know, that, that lasts about anything from about one to three, five seconds, and then just to get this uh, flat line, like I see, getting uh, somebody who had a cardiac arrest, is what they call the suppression pattern. So if you look at the left on this slide, you can see that uh, everything is just like uh, our three-year-old kids being given crayons and paper, and you see what they just scribble. That's what you see. You can see that it's disorganized, uh, it is high voltage. It does not appear to follow any pattern, and everything is just scattered. And then when you look at it from the left, you see the first second shows some activity, and then the last two seconds you just see what is called a flat line. So that's what you tend to get in the classic hips uh, arrhythmia. And then on the left and the one on the right is the post suppression. Of course, again, this is just trying to show the, front, the one on top is the classic uh, disorganized. Uh, hips arrhythmia. Then the one on the left showing it at the reduced um, sensitivity, and then you can see uh, you now have to be in some areas where you have multifocal activity. That this is just a game uh, for a six-month-old pattern. Now I'm going to talk about Lenos gastro. Um, what is interesting in this particular case is that. The moment you are managing any child and you think he's got a form of epilepsy, whether you think it was a straightforward case of epilepsy, whether you thought it was a focal epilepsy, 
whether you thought it was a generalized epilepsy, whether you thought it was an epilepsy syndrome, the moment you start to see more than one seizure type, and typically you tend to find things like, if you look at the last line there, where I wrote America, when the children tend to stare, jack and fall, Stare suggests an absence seizure, even though it's an atypical. Jack suggests to you that what if this child actually is having some form of generalized clonic uh, seizure or clonic seizure, and then the fall is a loss of tonicity and drops. So that is a tonic seizure. So if we now come back up, you see I write multiple seizure types at presentation. Mostly tonic, they stiffen. Then the occasional be a tonic, those are the ones that drop. And then the atypical absence are the ones that just stare. And because this staring may just be a few seconds, if you really don't pay attention, you might miss it. So I would advise that the moment you think that this child is having any seizure condition and you notice more than one seizure one, or like I keep telling with my, my own doctors, any moment you are managing anybody with a seizure, an epilepsy, and there is a cognitive and a behavioral problem, then look for an epilepsy syndrome. When you're looking at an epilepsy syndrome, then look for an epileptic encephalopathy. In that way, uh, you will not miss what is happening. The Europeans tend to use LGS to talk about a group of relatively rare, narrowly defined child epilepsy, uh, syndromes in children that have severe pneumonic epilepsy. For the Americans, their own is once there's a child with epilepsy and the child stares, it jacks, it falls, they just think that uh, this is likely the LGS. And it's been found out that one third, up to one third of cases are progressions from infant child spasms. Majority of cases of uh, Lemus gastro are symptomatic in etiology. And uh, if you see the red line that I did, it's just basically to show from my experience what has been the commonest reason. It's been hypoxic ischemic injury, CNS infection, and malformations. Um, I've had one case of a child with tuberous sclerosis. I haven't had any brain trauma as yet, and uh, frontal lesions, I haven't had that. But in the idiopathic category, uh, you can't just find anything. There's even normal psychomotor development. Um, there are no underlying disorders. There were no neurologic or neuroideologic abnormalities. In fact, I do remember a girl who presented at the age of seven. She's uh, one of two, a set of twins. The brother is a boy. I mean, the twin is a boy. And uh, nothing was wrong with this child until she just saw him started staring, jerking, and falling. And then she was back perpetually going into that state of, you know, just not being there and keeping away from everyone and just cognitively going down, behaviorally going down and all of that. And then we do the EEG and see what it is and we show us what is going on. So how do we manage? The principle is polytherapy. So when you think about Lennox gastro, is polytherapy. There's just no other way about it. And we're dealing with a minimum of three drugs. And usually, you really will evaporate the bazam carbogene. And then, uh, what you see in the next set of lines, just trying to, you know, the games that we play, because uh, it, 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 it's an intractable epilepsy, and then you are not likely just going to try a set of drugs and everything, you know, uh, eureka for you. It might be at the beginning. But down the line, things are going to happen and you're going to find yourself have to play around with drugs. So you are really going to have to learn pharmacology to the heart until you get epilepsy and then particularly when you're dealing with, dealing with epileptic encephalopathies. Steroids also tend to get to be used sometimes. Ketogenic diets tend to be used and then surgery. Of course, of this last three, steroid diet and surgery, it's only steroids that are played with and have actually, actually had some um, Anything. But it is obvious that if you're really going to be doing epilepsy, you're going to get those cases that are refractory, and then you're going to have to consider the beginning diet, and consider surgery. And in fact, you're also going to consider uh, neurophysiology and all of these insertables that we know. Cool.
comorbidities are cognitive, behavioral, psychosocial, uh, and others. Prognosis is not very good. 90% will continue to have seizures in adult life. Uh, drop seizures are the most difficult to treat. Uh, the tonic, atypical absences, and my joint seizures are better to treat. The EEG is characteristic. You have this generalized slow spike and wave. Just keep that generalized. What that is saying is that the background frequency will be less than it is supposed to be for the age. So you have it less than 2.5. Sometimes it can even be as low as one. Then you get the spike and slow wave disturbance. Or you have the sharp and slow wave disturbance. So one background is slow for age. Two, you have the spike or sharp or spike and sharp with slow wave uh, discharges. And then when the child is asleep, you might actually see what they call the paroxysmal fast activity in non-rapid eye movement. Hyperventilation might facilitate generalized sharp point discharges and uh, the atypical absences. Um, tonic seizures have said, you see PFAs in the tonic seizures, you see the GSWP and all of that and all of that. Now, you will see from this, this is a fantastic slide that you will see uh, that you see those spikes and you see the slow wave. You see, it's just like kind of like a repetitive thing. It's a generalized thing. You see the spike, you see the slow wave, and then you see uh, the detrimental uh, slowing that happens in this child. If you count, uh, 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 if each box actually represents one second, and you'll find that in this case, the maximum you're having is at most like two, uh, what you call now, two, 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 two waves at the most in this child. Thirdly is Landau Kleffner. What um, I, I actually want us to see something in this particular case that I don't, I, I'm not going to speak to the whole slide. I, I just want to bring out something. I, I had this young man who is 10 years now, I first saw at the age of seven, but he started visiting hospital at the age of three because they just suddenly noticed he was not talking as much. And then after a while, he ceased. Then he started to misbehave and he was being managed as one of the seizure disorders. And then he came to me at seven. And then I did an, I, I did an EEG and then I saw the characteristic feature, as you can see, in Landau Kleffner. Unfortunately, the danger here with Landau Kleffner is the fact that the later it takes for you to identify and treat the acquired aphasia, the less likely the child will recover lost speech. The child's seizures might stop. In fact, in a number of them, the child's seizures won't stop even if you need him to. But the child may be coming in aphasia. Second thing I want to bring out in this particular case with Landon Kleffner is that it could be confused with autism because you tend to find behavioral issues in Landon Kleffner just as you find with autism. More typically, you actually find them have um, ADHD. So you find both of them where a child was speaking before then suddenly he's not speaking anymore and then the child is to be gone and all of that. So somebody could be, oh, he's autism. Somebody would say he's not autism and all of that. But one major difference between the two of them is that the loss of speech in autism of course, in the toddler years, max four, three years, but in ladder cleft now is between three and five to six years. So that's something I think we need to pay attention to. Um, again, the Lander Kleffner paper also that is for us to see. Um, what this slide was actually speaking to is that Lander Kleffner is one of those uh, sleep related epileptic encephalopathies for which we also have a continuous spike with sleep and the ESES. So, this slide we're just trying to show you about the difference between the two of them. So, the EEG, you find that normal background interactively, but you have higher amplitude discharges in the temporal, parietal, and semi temporal areas. And this is enhanced by sleep deprivation and uh, in sleep. Now, if you look at this slide, unfortunately, I can't be able to show you guys very well. But if you look at the mid temporal uh, on the right, you would see something like the spike and the wave there, which is more demonstrable in, in sleep states. That's the one on the right as compared with the awake state. So, though you could see some spike and wave activity occurring 
their weight state at the right parasagittal and also at the right temporal, and then very, very slightly at the left uh, temporal. But you could easily miss this out. All that uh, fuzziness that you see is actually uh, muscle artifactual activity, which is why when the child is asleep, you don't see that on the right side. But uh, when you start to think that this may be Lando Klefner or any of the sleep encephalopathies, you must do a sleep EEG, otherwise you'll miss it out. Um, again, this one is yes, yes. Then lastly, why I wanted to bring out the injury of Rank Rasmus Sin is that I've only seen one case. Unfortunately, the boy is dead now. He started out about the age of six, seven. He was actually abandoned because of his seizures, which started from about the age of five years. So the parents got tired of him by seven. The seizures became intractable. He started with a left focal um, seizures and then got worse. The child developed a, hemi a hemiplegia. The child also developed cognitive delay. The child developed a behavioral problems. So also lost speech. That's why the parents abandoned him. So it was uh, from the uh, because the government uh, care homes that was brought to our care and the process of evaluation. Yes, we noticed the hemiplegia and all of those other kind of things, but the, the key to it came from when we did an MRI and then we noticed that then on the right side, there was this hemispheric atrophy and then the neurologic deficit over the period of management was just a progressive uh, deterioration. She just got worse. Uh, got worse and got more uh, more difficult until the child would be like. So I think it's something we need to pay attention to. This is the reason why I brought it. Then there's also the paper which was published in relation to this child, which I think if you're interested, you can get to see. Now, in concluding, I wanted to highlight a few things. The first two, Otahara and the early myoclonic encephalopathy, because we're dealing with uh, those of us in private practice now, I will say in the hospital, the teaching of school practice, I haven't had any one of these two children. And it stands to reason because of the peculiar nature of these children. Of the Hara is something that happens within the first 10 days, max three months. The early myoclonic um, uh, uh, they also happens in the initial period. But what distinguishes the two of them is the fact that when you get this early tonic seizure, sometimes focal, and you find a new unit, please do an EEG. And all these are assumed that with the new units, until proven otherwise, when they have seizures, it is bad news, and you must investigate it until you don't find anything, until the EEG is normal, until the MRI is normal, until the child's cognition, uh, sorry, child's uh, disposition neurologically is normal and the child is great as it should, then you don't worry. But when a new unit is convulsing and you can't find a reason it's abnormal until proven otherwise. So I think that is why one thing I just wanted to bring out in case of these two children uh, in, in private practice, just don't assume that there's no problem. It's, it's just better to get the second person to look at it and then you'll be comfortable. Then the third one also, that's Dravet syndrome that I want us to pay attention to. It's also in private practice. You would not believe that. I have not made a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, but I know it is there. Why is this a problem? Why have I not seen it? I have not seen it because these children in the first six months of life, they're likely to be fine until they develop what we call the supposed fibrant seizures. But the problem with their own form of fibrin seizures is that right from the very first one, it's downhill all the way. The second six months of life, the parents will describe to you that they are losing their child. A child that was vivacious, that was playing, that was everything until the fibrin seizures started. Then the seizures could last as long as one hour, could last as 30 minutes last even longer than that, or sometimes even going to status. And they now find themselves going in and out of hospital and the child just continues to get worse. Please pay attention. Do not think this is a straightforward uh, fibrile conversion. Just think gravity. And why have they not come to me? They don't come to me because they get so bad, they are probably not so well managed. Before they get to even you guys, damage has been done, a lot of them die particularly maybe during the prolonged seizure, somebody 
uh, feet inside water. Somebody gave them cow's urine and all of that. So I think we're losing them to early death because of you know the the, the rapid downhill course. And I would suggest to those of us in private practice that once we get children with supposed advanced seizures and they start to cognitively or neurologically start to look different, or their fibular seizures are lasting longer than 15 minutes, think gravity and ask for an EEG. For infantile spasm, like I did say, let us understand the commonness of all of these things. It's easily mixed up with what we call the standard colleagues. It is not, it's not that simple. The good news here is that we pick them early, always ask for EEGs, we ask for video recordings, do MRIs, we get the chance to actually get them better. With Lenos Gasto, once you have more than two seizure types, think Lenos Gasto, once you see cognitive behavioral issues, think Lenos Gasto, insist on getting an EEG done, insist on getting the right set of people to report the EEG. I really would have wanted to discuss on the value of getting proper EEGs done. Lando Kleffner, I've told you, I've discussed that, and the fact that it can be confused with certain children with autism. Now, these last few slides are just, just to show their diagnostic algorithms to show us how we can get to make a diagnosis and we can see that there. Um, what is my take home? It's that childhood epileptic encephalopathy is all core in Nigerian children. Infantile spasms are the commonest. Transition from infantile spasm to Lenos gastro is seen in a third of cases. Lenos gastro is a polymorphic seizure condition that is characterized by more than two seizure types. The EEG is very important in making diagnosis and managing children with child epileptic encephalopathies. Only pharmacy is the norm. Behavioral, cognitive, and neurologic deficits should be expected. Management is in the long term and will eventually require multidisciplinary care early diagnosis, appropriate and timely management is rewarded. This next slide just shows the summary, summary of some of these things. I'd like to thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Salisu, for an excellent presentation, um, very comprehensive presentation. And I, and I love the way you simplified it for those of us who are not in teaching hospitals of how we could make that diagnose, diagnosis very easily. While you were speaking, um, one of our respected institutions and pillars of pediatrics in, in, in West Africa, I, I must say, Dr. Bola Ajani Fuja joined us. Uh, wow. I hope he came at the end. Heard. No, 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 he came right in the, somewhere in the middle. Uh, Dr. I'm going to faint. Is, 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 over 90, he's still in active pediatric practice. And it's very encouraging for people like us, young people like me, to see him no end to learning. And there's no age at which you stop learning. And I, and I really appreciate Dr. Ajeni Fuja for joining us this afternoon um, from his um, house. Um, uh, Papa, you're most welcome. So at this point, um, we will take comments or questions. Like I said, um, if you had any questions, please put them in the chat. Or if by just by raising your hand, please use the raise hand. Um, don't just switch on your mic. Just wait to be to be recognized. Just raise your hand or put your questions in the chat, and I, I will read them read them out. Um, <clears throat> any questions? Um, Again, we'd like to welcome our colleagues from all over the world who are joining us for this uh, uh, presentation. I think it's a credit to the private practitioners, pedi pediatricians in practice in, in Lagos to attract the quality of membership we have on the platform this afternoon. So any, anybody, anybody with questions, please indicate by raising your hand. No, nope. yet. Dr. Salisu, I hope that your presentation has not suppressed the burst activity in the brains. <laughs> Ask questions. <laughs> 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 but 
but I'm sure not. I'm sure not. I'm sure not. <laughs> Okay, Doctor, we have Nifade. Doctor Nifade, kindly unmute yourself and please ask your question. You're most welcome all the way from, I'm not even sure where Doctor Nifade is right now, whether it's in the UK or America or Nigeria, but I'm sure she will tell us where she is. Over to you, Doctor Nifade. She's in Lagos. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Doctor Salis, for your beautiful, um, um, lecture. I just uh, thought I'll just ask um, a couple of things. The first one has to do with, um, you know, the hemispherectomy, because most of these um, encephalopathies or epileptic encephalopathies you've said to us are symptomatic, 70-80%, that's a large number. So the hemispherectomy, which group of children, I, I noticed you said intractable seizures, which group of children would it be best in? And um, the ones with metabolic uh, problems, obviously they won't benefit from hemispherectomies and stuff like that. I also wanted you to talk to two things that really have captured my imagination in the last um, few years. One is um, the elastic seizures in children with um, hematomas of the hypothalamus. That caught me on a way uh, seriously a few years back and was really very worrisome for me. Um, if you'll just talk to that. And um, if you can please tell us if, um, Vagal nerve stimulation has any role to play in these children with the. Hello? Um, yes, yeah. you can't hear me. Please, can you call me back in 30 minutes? I'm in a meeting. So I just wondered if you could talk uh, to us a little bit about vagal nerve stimulation and if it has any role to play in the management of these children with um, um, epileptic encephalopathies. Um, just to clear my head a bit, because you talked about the diet, you know, uh, VNS is another thing that I see and I don't really understand, you know. Uh, sorry, ma, I, I kind of like missed your question. Okay, so was, let, uh, let me summarize, let me summarize. Can I summarize yeah. for you? He yeah. mentioned three yeah. things, the role of who benefits from hemispherectomy. Okay. About the... Um, this idea of gelastic seizures. Uh, and the third thing was on, what was the third thing again? Vegan nerve stimulation. Vegan nerve stimulation. The role, okay. is there any benefit of vegan nerve stimulation? Please note okay. the question, Salisu, because you will be taking them together. I, I will right. quickly look through the chat. Um, Professor Grange, you're most welcome, Ma, <laughs> former Minister of Health, again, I guess it's only Dr. Mobalaji Lawal that can bring Professor Grange and Dr. Jenny Fuja out of retirement to come and attend to us. I really appreciate it. Um, Professor Grange has asked about the mechanism of action of steroids in infantile spasms. Uh, we have a comment from Papa Jenny Fuja, who's just uh, wishing us well um, and appreciating the display of expertise from you and wishing us Happy New Year. Um, Dr. Mike Okobo, I believe from the US, uh, wanted a comment to, um, on the response of treatment in symptomatic versus idiopathic West syndrome. Um, that, unfortunately, these are all in the chat. So if you, and then finally, Dr. Dudu uh, was asking about the differentiation between benign myoclonic jerks in units from suspected cases of infantile spasms or an encephalopathy. So I think we will just take those comments and questions first as the first round, uh, knowing that we only have 10 minutes for this session. So maybe this will be the only questions we will take for now. Dr. Salis, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, first, uh, role of hemispherectomy. One, uh, like I did say, you know, 
I can only speak at that theoretically because I'm not in surgery. I can only say to you that a hysterectomy definitely becomes useful where the problem is structural and, um, you know, um, MRI, fMRI, PET scan, all, all of this stuff that the neurosurgeons do recognize and determine that the focus of the problem is coming from that side, then it does. But it actually goes beyond even when you find structural injuries because there are neurosurgeons that are very daring. Some of them have actually reported that even when it did appear, they didn't see anything structurally, whether it's hemispherotomy, uh, hemispherotomy whether it's a corpus callosotomy, all sorts of kinds of surgeries and gotten all sorts of kinds of outcomes. So the details in discussing about um, the various surgeries that are done, you know, this is the best I can give that it's clear when you find a structural problem on the imaging, but when you don't, some people have still gone ahead and gotten some form of results or the other. Second, on gelastic seizures, I've only had one case of gelastic seizure. Um, was a six-year-old girl, but unfortunately, I never saw her again. After that first uh, review, I couldn't even get to get the EEG report. It was just a, a diagnosis that I made and asked them to do tests. And then they just never came back. So that's the only experience I've had with elastic seizures. I cannot say anything more than that, except uh, when I now start to talk about theories. And honestly, um, it's not an aspect of uh, epilepsy that I have paid that much attention to for now. Um, vagus nerve stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation falls into the category of uh, the neurostimulation procedures. Uh, uh, they go beyond uh, vagus nerve stimulation and uh, they, they, they've gone to deep brain stimulation. They even, they're even talking about implanting uh, nano, what's it called now, where. Uh, these things can actually recognize the seizures are about to come on and then they self-actuate and release the drug that will then uh, stop uh, the seizure. So that area of uh, neurophysiology uh, and uh, intervention in managing epilepsy is, I must say, is quite exciting, is much more. And yes, vegan stimulation when it's affordable, they've gotten results as good as 50% reduction in the, the, in, the, in the seizure frequency, but nobody has reported vagal nerve stimulation giving 100% uh, seizure remission. Yeah, so when it works, it's as much as 50%. Mechanism of action of steroids in infantile spasms, the best I can say is that uh, immune mediation is a presumption. Just as we know generally, generally speaking, in our days in medical school, when you've done everything, though it has changed now, knowledge has improved. In those days, when you've done everything, now you don't know what else to do, just still wait and see what happens. So um, I, I do not uh, have the knowledge at this minute to be able to go to the cellular mm -hmm. level to tell us how the students are working. But in terms of the effect on the immune mediation, probably or something like that. So I'll need to go and check uh, the details of that. I can speak very Dr. Salisu. Ready, idiomatic and idiopathic. Uh, unfortunately, like I did say, I have not published that series I was telling you about. Because these are cases of patients that I have handled, it was obvious to me that those children who actually improved, you know, looking back at it, I realized that they were the ones that we couldn't find a reason for their infantile spasms. So they were the idiopathic category. And then when I looked at the other publications, everybody found and said that, well, those who do better tend to be those in which you could not find um, a, a, a reason for, for their infantile spasm. So yes, idiopathic cases tend to do better, but does it say that symptomatic cases cannot, do, cannot improve? I have had those who are symptomatic. In fact, I've had a particular three-month-old girl. I remember that 
very well because no, sorry, this girl was six months. I remember her very well because she came from unfortunately my town, Ikorodu, and the child had been jerking for like a month. And uh, I literally begged the mother to stay because she thought the child was going to die. But amazingly, that was the fastest response in terms of seizure abortion that I got. In three days, the seizures are stopped. By the time I did the repeat uh, EEG, even the pulse suppression, hips arrhythmia had stopped. By the time the child came back a week after I'd follow up, there was no cognitive uh, impairment and all of that. So either way, it's not that symptomatic and not improve, but on a wait for weight, you are likely to get better improvement in those who are idiopathic. The last thing of benign myotonic jets versus uh, severe seizures, very straightforward. What you would find is that in children with benign myotonic jerks, where, where, uh, where they have the, 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 the seizures, they have the seizures and they, they are fine thereafter. You don't find any cognitive uh, injuries. You don't, uh, you don't find any neurological deficits. You don't find any regression in terms of behavior and all of that. They're just fine. And then um, whether it is the neonatal myoclonus or the benign infantile myoclonus, these are things that with or without therapy, they just blow over. You know, one of them we did the first year, the other one by the second year, and then you don't find any deficits at all that happens um, to the child. So everybody's fine. But for the severe cases of which Dravet is the poster boy, <laughs> even when you treat, even with tripentol, even with cannabidiol, even with whatever, it's more or less that you wish the devil to actually visit rather than for somebody you know to actually have a, a Travis syndrome, which is a severe myoclonic epilepsy of infants. Thank you very much for the responses you have given. Uh, there's a last comment from Dr. Wenike Briggs. Um, and of course she highlights the, the point you have made that multidisciplinary management is important and is crucial. And she was wondering, is this aspect of integrated care available in a single setting? I think that's not a question for Dr. Salisu, who is, but I think it's a question for the established pediatric hospitals like Lifeline, because indeed, multidisciplinary management is available in private. I, I know that enough. Uh, so maybe, uh, and, and Dr. Wenike Briggs, I'm surprised you're asking the question. You are in Iduna Hospital, which is a multi-specialty hospital in Lagos, in Apapa. So I, I think maybe that's a question for Lifeline. And I know quite a number of the Lifeline people are on, on, on the platform and the, and, the, and the big hospitals like uh, ML Hospital and all the big, big hospitals that we have on the platform is multi-integrated, multidisciplinary care available in private practice. And I think that's the question I'm going to leave for the MDs of the various pediatric pediatric practices. Well, Dr. Salis, you can answer the question. If you yeah, I, I actually think that you're right to the extent that uh, for now, the best care will come from private because the problem of multidisciplinary management in government hospitals is very tiring. However, associated with that statement is cost. I do know, I've spoken with Dr. Bonifati, uh, I think, of a Premier Specialist. No, no Lifeline. I've Life, is it lifeline? Life okay, yeah. there's this person in the Premier Specialist. I've forgotten her name now. Second one, apart from Dr. Fadi Maybe Dr. Person, Aluko. Maybe Dr. Dr. Aluko. Dr. Aluko, fantastic. She, because she's so much into developmental. So I know she's thinking along that line. I've uh, also spoken to Dr. Mrs. Uh, the lady in the outreach. Uh, Dr. Dokubo, I think. Second, yeah. yeah, so she too is thinking along that line. But I honestly think that this is the kind of place where this can happen. You understand? It has to start from private. I will honestly tell you, it cannot start from government. Government is too dis dis disjointed. It has to start from one specific private that is going to sit down, get a team together. And the team is not just a neurologist, it's not just a pediatrician. It's also going to include medical officers that do their own part of the job. It's going to include PT, it's going to include OT, it's going to include the speech. It's going, and when we're talking PT, it's not even the standard PT. 
We're talking about PT that has done developmental, that has done developmental physiotherapy. The way they manage is just totally different. And I've had terrible outcomes with physiotherapists who are managing orthopedic cases now coming to manage the children that I have. They just lock their knees, lock their, what's it called, their waist, and then this student will never walk, no matter what it is. <laughs> Dr. Mabala Jawal is laughing. Because this is what I do every day, and I literally cry some of the times. They've done so much damage to these children, you know, that I it's really very bad. So we really have to start from private. That's just it. All right. Okay. So thank you very much for your comments. I think um, I hope that answers Dr. Wenke Briggs' question. But I think the important thing we need to take away: encephalopathies, epileptic encephalopathies, are best coordinated by pediatric neurologists. I mean. It's frightening on its own. And a lot of people shy away from managing seizures because it's so easy to mess up if you don't know what you're doing. And I think even if the private hospitals are developing teams and it's possible to do that, must understand that you are developing a team of specialists and its cost is expensive in private. Private practice in a private, private care in Nigeria, if without um, insurance is a very expensive Thing, especially for, for seizure management like this, it will involve a lot. And I think it's not something that is impossible, but I think it's something that um, is doable. I, I wonder if there are any comments from any other, from the US, uh, have any comments, experience from the US as we round up experiences from Syria alone. I see, I see Dr. Nelly Bell is on the platform. Um, uh, and um, and experiences from the UK. I see Dr. Harold Shodipo and Dr. Nifade are on the platform. I think we 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 stand to learn from this uh, from from one another. Uh, and those will be the last comments before I hand over back to Dr. Eletu. Any comments from the UK, from Sierra Leone, or from the US, Dr. Michael? Uh, any, any final words? If there, are, if there aren't any, we can close, but um, I think we have another five more minutes before I hand over back. So I think Dr. Harold Shodipo, Dr. Nifade, Dr. Okobo, Dr. Bell. Um, I, I'm just going to say in the UK, Yes. they don't allow us ordinary mortals. <laughs> to touch their neurology patients, their epilepsy patients. So like you said, it has to be led by an epileptologist. That's right. So all that happens is we see them and transfer them to the epilepsy, uh, epilepsy clinic. So we don't really have the opportunity to... Um, that's why I was asking the question on vegan, on vegan nerve stimulation. So I yeah. hear these things and I don't really understand what's going on. So you sort of have your specialist uh, right. epileptologist, you have your specialist uh, epilepsy nurse, you have all of those um, people that uh, Dr. Salisu mentioned, form a team to look after these children. So that first time they get the best treatment, to get the treatment um, that they need. And it's not like we, uh, ordinary mortals are playing around with them. I don't know yeah, what- Not ordinary mortals, but yes. <laughs> but I, the point is, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, um, any comments from the US, Dr. Okubu? You're, please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, please. Um, Dr. Letu, can you unmute Dr. Kubo? Okay, okay great, great. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Salisu, for an excellent presentation. I'm particularly delighted to see that uh, we're having a, a body of pediatric neurologists uh, in the private sector uh, that will help in managing these uh, patients. As you know, I'm sure we're just in the tip of the iceberg, there are lots of children with these problems. And um, uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Leshi for moderating this. And uh, I, I hope uh, we can get the necessary momentum to support these pediatric neurologists. Uh, Dr. Nifadi made an important point. This is a, a group of children that 
uh, we just have to transfer to the experts who are really good at managing these type of cases. You can really very easily uh, go the wrong path managing these cases. It might sound very simple, but it's not. Uh, yeah. That's all I have to say here. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, yeah, um, any experiences from Sierra Leone? Nelly, any, any comments from Sierra Leone? Before we close. Um, yes, hello, good afternoon from Sierra Leone. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, we've learned a lot and refreshed our memories a lot as well. Um, we, as you know, we have Professor Gabriel Kofowe with us, um, who's a pediatric neurologist. Um, for us in Sierra Leone, it's a very new topic and a very new area. And um, we're just starting to develop. We just got our first EEG in the hospital in Olajurin and um, the first one for you know, pediatric neurology in Sierra Leone. So we're looking forward to the growth of pediatric neurology in Sierra Leone. And um, um, we have a whole lot of patients who have been missing. And um, thank you so much for this presentation because definitely um, we, our, our um, knowledge on this topic has, has expanded a lot. And we know that it, it will be a great help uh, for Prof. Gabriel as well, because we'll be then sending him all of these patients uh, so that they can have early diagnosis and early management. So thank you so much. Over. Thank, thank you very much. I, I, I really appreciate it. I think there's one message. I mean, fortunately, we have the ancient modern on our platform. I think there's one message for the, the modern and the young ones is that there is a field out there in pediatric neurology. And I think there are, we need more people training in pediatric neurology, going for courses on EEGs, on how to do EEGs, how to interpret EEGs, um, choice of anticonvulsants and all that. There's a field out there. And I think we just need to encourage um, each and every one of us, especially the young ones, to please take an interest in, in, in this kind of this area. We are getting, I mean, I'm not old as Dr. Jenny Fuja, but I'm getting old. Uh, and, and so it's important that we replace ourselves very quickly uh, uh, in private, in, 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 in practice in our various countries. On that note, I really, it's been a pleasure moderating this session. And I hand over back to Dr. Eletu and Dr. Mobolaji Lawal. Thank you very much and Happy New Year. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Falabi. Before I will round up, I'd just like to ask Dr. Mubalaji Lawal if you have any, if the last words before we close. Well, just to thank uh, Professor Leshi for uh, very ably handling the session as the moderator uh, and giving us his uh, insights into the whole issues and uh, also the lecturer, um, you know, Dr. Salisu for a very excellent uh, uh, lecture. And especially his, uh, you know, his great attempt to try and simplify it for general pediatricians and the lessons that are to be learned are very clear. Um, also contributions from the, um, you know, of everyone, uh, the, the elders. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Duarte is around. I've not seen her on the, on the, on the, uh, on the guest list. Is she around? Because I don't want to do the vote of thanks for her. Um, but just to acknowledge contributions from everyone, um, both from the, within the country, Nigeria, and from uh, outside the country, United States, United Kingdom, Sierra Leone, uh, for Professor Grange, Dr. Jenny Fuja. I mean, you know, I'm so pleased with the way things are turning out on this platform. And, uh, you know, the benefits of this group are just beginning to unfold day by day and I can see many more. So thank you everyone and a happy new year in advance. I hand over back to Dr. Elitu. I don't know if Dr. Um, uh, Dr. I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen uh, one. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So um, yeah. just to say thank you very much to each and everyone who has participated in this presentation today. We will look forward to the next presentation, which is slated for 27th of January, 2022. And we already have Dr. Kunle Ayoridi, who will be talking to us from the US, uh, from the UK, sorry. So very soon, I'm sure we'll invite presentations from the US and from 
the other uh, other colleagues in diaspora. Well, Dr. Ayeri has graciously agreed to make a presentation on the 27th of January. So we all look forward to the next presentation. A big thank you to Dr. Salisu. Like I said at the beginning, before others joined, uh, don't worry that I was uh, hounding you and chasing you all over Lagos about this presentation. <laughs> I'm sure you sure they did. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say a big thank you for volunteering to present to us today, and I'm sure we shall still come back to you at some point in time. And to all those who joined from all over the world, thank you very much. I would like to sign off by wishing each and every one of us a happy new year and a prosperous new year in advance. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you. And bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.